This episode of Gators Breakdown is brought to you by MyBookie. Go bet with MyBookie. Sign up at MyBookie.ag and use promo code Gators to get your 50% deposit bonus. Bet with MyBookie. Gators Breakdown. The Gators Fan Podcast. Because there's never a dull moment in Gator Nation. Gators Breakdown Podcast is ready to go. I'm your host, David Waters, and you can find me on Twitter at GatorDave underscore SCC. With the Gators taking on an overmatched Idaho team. Uh, so instead of previewing the Vandals this entire episode, I thought it would be a good time to catch up on the world of recruiting and the recruiting trail. So joining me on this episode of Gators Breakdown is Corey Bender from Gators Territory on the Rivals Network. Corey, thanks for joining me here on Gators Breakdown. Yeah, thanks for having me on, David. All right, Corey, it's, uh, it's been a fun season covering these Gators, but, uh, of course, the recruiting never slows down. Absolutely, and that's the thing, too. I know right now we're getting the crunch of it. I know it's early sign period coming up. I know Florida right on rivals are seeing routes out of the top 25 as far as their whole overall 2019 class, but um, they're in the rank for a, a several, about over a handful of people um, in that rivals 250 ranking, so... Um, it's going to be an important time for Florida to close out well, and uh, obviously some big names will be on campus in the coming weeks as well. So Dan Mullen and the staff will definitely have their opportunity to kind of you know boost that recruiting ranking. Absolutely, absolutely. And before we dive in here with Corey, remember you can find Gators Breakdown on news4jacks.com slash Gators Breakdown. You'll find all the Gators Breakdown episodes as well as the articles from the News for Jack sports team. Also catch us on iTunes, Google Play, YouTube, Spotify, and when using their services, please share, rate, and review the show. Let Gator Nation know what they're getting. We Gators Breakdown, and on uh, social media, follow Gators Breakdown on Twitter and Facebook, at Gators Breakdown. So, Corey, while it's not a huge game for the Gators versus Idaho, it's still a chance to host recruits in the swamp, uh, a swamp on a game day. So what's this visit list looking like this weekend for the Idaho game? Yeah, as of right now, they have one official visitor, Nathan Pickering, who's committed to Mississippi State. Um, he's a kid out of uh, Mississippi, about 6'5", 277 pounds. He's, he's ranked about top 160 players overall in the country. as a strong relationship with Coach Mullen. Um, and that's basically, he basically knows him for the past several years when Mullen was recruiting him at Mississippi State. Um, he's the headliner, one of Florida's top targets along the defensive line. And uh, another one is Dewan Black, um, obviously committed to Florida, Rivals 250 commit. Um, Trent Whitmore, uh, their Florida safety commit out of Buckholz will be in attendance. And another kid, uh, Aiden Kininiana, um, he's a four-star defensive tackle from Brighton, Colorado, 2000, 2020 prospect. Um, his father actually played college football at Billy Gonzalez at Colorado State. So he was a kid that was offered within the past month, and he wasted no time scheduling that visit. Um, you know, he's a blue-chip prospect. Um, good size, about 6'3", 285 pounds. So he'll be coming out for unofficial. And uh, actually, just add to the list this morning is Isaiah Walker out of Miami, Norland. Uh, he's a 2020 prospect, four stars. He's committed to South Carolina. And he, this is a kid that was really making a strong push for the same, a whole lot of mail, a lot of edits. And um, basically, for this staff now actually re offered once they got him in camp. So you had McElwain staff that offered him. Then he came back in camp for, uh, for Dan Mullen. Staff got the offer. And uh, now he's became a top target for them. So. Um, there's a lot of kids in town, Gervon Dexter to commit, a lot of, excuse, a lot of underclassmen highlighting this list, and um, there's obviously a good handful there of maybes, too, um, that could be in attendance, like Anthony Richardson for this 2020 quarterback commit. So I think this list is going to be, obviously, the noon kickoff, so those are kind of 50-50 as far as some of these unofficial, go, unofficial visits go, but um, obviously the headliner for this weekend is Nathan Pickering, um, committed to Mississippi State, a big defensive line target who uh, Gil Mullen's going to be rolling out the red carpet for. Absolutely. You talk about headliners, and of course the headliner probably in the whole class for the Gators is running back Trey Sanders coming off a visit where he got to see a dominant rush performance by the Gators offense and Jordan Scarlett and Michael P. Ryan. You know, that should only help Florida, but is Bama still the team to beat here? Yeah, I still like Alabama right here. Obviously, you know, Trey's been a tense for multiple games this year. Obviously, this past weekend when he went to go see for the South Carolina game. And uh, like you said, obviously, Florida obviously is doing I mean, especially South Carolina, they did a great job running the ball, and that can only impress a kid like Trey. But um, as of right now, to go with my gut, I know a lot of Florida fans are going to want him to go the other way, but I still kind of feel like he's Alabama's to lose as of right now. He's going up to Tuscaloosa on November 24th for his official visit for the Iron Bowl, so that's obviously something to look out for. Um, I think Florida definitely is that second school, though. I think they did have some room to make up, and um, obviously he's been in tendency to support his brother who's on the team, but I still like Alabama's chances. Um, he recently, like I said before, took a visit to Florida for the South Carolina game. He was at FSU as well uh, for one of their games. So 
Um, I think as of right now, I think the big thing is getting Trey on, uh, on campus for extended, obviously for extended stay for official visit. Obviously nothing scheduled right now. Um, so I think that's the main thing with the staff is hopefully getting them on campus, um, you know, once the season's over with for a long period of time. That way the staff can spend a little bit more time with them and hopefully they can work some magic with them as well. You know, Texas received an official, uh, but I do like Alabama's chances with Trey Sanders as of right now. Um, and like I said before, the main thing is getting him on campus for a few you know, multiple days to really hopefully sway his mind to see if uh, he'll be a Gator. But I like Alabama right now. Absolutely there. And uh, Quashon Fuller coming off uh, a visit this past weekend as well for the South Carolina game and now looks to be wavering on his commitment to FSU. Uh, is that a sign the Gators could be the team to look out for here? Yeah, I think Miami's in there as well. Um, when we spoke to him after that South Carolina game, he said, quote, I think my commitment's around a 70 or 60. Basically, I think he's referring to a percentage as far as where his commitment is. And the biggest thing with Ford is just getting his mom on board. Um, when the previous staff was recruiting him, they got him on campus last year. And, um, you know, it, he didn't leave the best taste as far as the biggest impression on his mother, um, the old staff. And the biggest, biggest thing with Ford is just trying to win his mom over. And same thing with Miami and these other schools as well. Um, she's very high on Florida State and, um, you know, the staff is really trying to recruit her just as much as they're recruiting Quashan as well. And, uh, but the good thing with that is his mom will be on the official visit. Uh, actually, all his official visits will take place in December. His mother will be in attendance for that as well, and that, that's actually huge. And of all the schools, you know, going for him, Alabama, Auburn, um, obviously, four State will get official in Miami and Florida. So he has all five official visit destinations picked out. It's just about scheduling those uh, those dates. But the thing is with Quashan Ford, he's a versatile kid. He can play a number of spots along the D line. And, uh, you know, he's, he's basically getting recruited to play the same role as Polite is, and that's what the staff stressed him more the weekend. And I think these official visits in December are going to be huge. And uh, obviously his mother will be in attendance, and, and that's just as big. He kind of – obviously he's going to have a say of where, he, where he's going to go, but also he basically said, where my mom's the most comfortable, that's probably where I'm going to go. So it's not just getting, uh, you know, convincing him, but also, you know, getting his mother on board as well. But Ford is right there along with Miami. I think those two schools probably had the best chance, I would say, to get him as far as if he was to make a flip. But like I said, Alabama and Auburn are going to get him on campus at some point as well. And all five of those schools are really making him priority. So um, his commitment, like you said, the four C is pretty shaky <laughs> at best. And um, it's going to be interesting. I think his official visits are going to be huge as far as where he ultimately ends up at the next level. All right. Corey Bender from Gators Territory joining us right here on Gators Breakdown. Of course, another big-time prospect the Gators are – Targeting right now, Kyrie Elam visited Georgia last week, and now some talk out there that Georgia could be taking the lead in his recruitment. Uh, would you say that, and, 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 or in, and is it really only just Georgia as Florida's main competition, or will he be looking elsewhere as well? Yeah, I've been on the record, mostly saying on our website too, I've always thought Elam would be eventually, I, I could see him taking his visits, but I thought at the very end when it came down to it, I thought he'd be a Gator, but for what I'm hearing from a few sources, I know I'm hearing Georgia really knocked it out of the park during their official visit, and uh, I'm, I'm being, it's almost, to me, honestly, this is uh, all the kids Florida's going after. This is the one that's the closest to a coin flip for me. Um, obviously, the ties are with Florida. I mean, there's some familiarity there. He's been on campus a number of times. Um, Dan Mullen and his wife have both actually been recruiting. You know, he has a great relationship with both of them from when he went to Friday Night Lights. And basically, he knows so many players on the team. But from what I know, I know he, he definitely has that strong interest in Georgia. And um, from what I've heard, they couldn't have done any better on this official visit. So, um, I'm almost, if I was forced to kind of pick today, I'd be probably leaning 51% Georgia and 49% Florida. That's how close it is, in my opinion. And, um, I think the Florida official visit is going to be really key. Like I said, Georgia, I think for Florida's sake, I think having him go to Georgia already for his official was good. That way, you know, once the season's over, Florida can have same, same type of thing with these other kids too. Um, with Trey Sanders, kind of having more time with these kids on these officials rather than coming on a game weekend. And I know a lot of the top targets will be looking to come in in December uh, for their Gators official visit. So I, I do kind of like Georgia just very slightly over Florida right now, but that, that's the closest one to a coin flip. And um, those are the two schools. Ohio State was a school that was mentioned in the past with him. He did visit Florida State several months back too. But when it comes down to it, I, I truly think, yeah, it's going to be a Florida-Georgia battle. But I think it's going to come down to that Florida official and, yeah, it's going to be one you just got to wait till the very end, and hopefully, you know, there's going to be a one on one side, and there's going to be fans that are disappointed on the other. It's going to be an interesting run for them. Absolutely, there, Corey, and, I, and to make you know, heck of a defensive back duo, if they could get Elam, would also also be to to get Chris Steele, who decommitted from USC about a month ago, and of course, Florida was a team that could, you know, that that could be end up getting his uh, end, end up getting his commitment. 
Uh, are the Gators still having to fend off some schools out west for uh, for Steele right now? Yeah, I think Oregon's the other school outside of Florida that really has a great shot. Um, he's a kid that already took his officials already. He went to Oklahoma as well, South Carolina, and LSU, in, in addition to the, the ones I've already mentioned. So, But I think when it comes down to it, um, it's going to come down to Florida and Oregon. And I talked to him about a week ago, and I asked him, hey, you already took your officials. Are you going to take any other, other uh, any unofficials before you commit? And he said, quote, I think I'm good with visits. So um, I think that holds well for Florida right there. He took multiple visits to Florida this year, uh, one on his own dime, and then obviously one for his official visit. Um, yeah, he came out for the Gator Grill out early in the year, the uh, big recruiting event they had. And, uh, yeah, I like Florida's chances right now. I really do. If I was someone said, hey, what's your your, uh, your prediction for him, I definitely would say Florida. He'll be announcing uh, in early January at the All-American game in, uh, in San Antonio. And I'll be heading out there as well. you got Dewan Black. Muhammad Diabate, you have a lot of a few Florida commits uh, competing at that game, and then hopefully Chris Steele. You know, if he's you know if he ends up coming to Florida, that'd be more for Florida fans to follow. So I'll be heading out there to cover that announcement. Uh, but I do like Florida's chances with him. He's a strong relationship with the staff. Um, he you know he's one of those kids that labels Florida as DBU. Even when he's committed to USC, he was one of those kids that was just publicly still show uh, you know love to Florida, and there's always something to kind of keep an eye on. So once he decommits from USC. Yeah, that's where my mind immediately went. You know, Oregon's been, had some uh, had some you know momentum with them as well, but I definitely think now that he's done with business, he thinks you know he's seen everything he's needed to see. Um, you know, and if, with that being said, I think Florida has you know my prediction is Florida for Steel. So we'll see in early January he picks into Oregon, Oklahoma, some other schools in there as well. But there's a lot going in Florida's favor. Um, the relationship with a lot of the commits, the staff, um, just a lot of familiarity there. So um, I definitely for Florida. I like Chris Steele. You know, as far as their chances with him. And you mentioned DeWan Black's name, you know, a couple of times here and how he'll be on campus this weekend. Of course, not playing uh, this fall and, and con concentrating or come down here to Florida, concentrating on grades. With everything still looking on the, uh, on the upper tw upward trend of him uh, being in this class when it's said and done and not having to maybe go JUCO or anything first? Yeah, it's been back, kind of back and forth as far as, you know, the report, kind of from people I've heard as far as how it's going to go down. And, uh, yeah, from what I've heard is definitely everything's going well. He's been working his butt off as far as in the classroom, you know, working with him, working with him, you know, not away from the classroom when it comes to the football stuff. So this is a kid who's dialed down. He's really focused. And, uh, he's publicly said, he's like, I wish I could, you know, redo some things, you know, so he wouldn't be in this position. But no, he's been working hard. He's already because Sidney Osceola, he's been working hard. Um, like I said, every, from everything I've heard, everything is kind of trending in the right direction for him. And, uh, yeah, he'll be, he'll be competing at the Army games. I mean, well, it's not Army anymore, the All American game in Texas. So, um, it'll be interesting to see him finally compete for a while. But like I said, we haven't really seen him compete, you know, in several months as far as, you know, like a football related activity. So, um, yeah, from everything I heard in the classroom, everything is going up on the right way. And uh, like I said, he's doing all the right things, too. Like, it's getting crunch time as far as, you know, kids graduating in the last several months. So it's an important time for him. And that's, where he, that's why he's kind of been more quiet, I guess you could say, on social media. Um, he's just been kind of dialed down. He knows it's an important time for him. So, um, you know, he's doing his best. And, you know, it's going to be kind of a wait-and-see thing once it comes time to sign day. And, uh, but everything I've heard, you know, everything's kind of turning up. All right. A few more thoughts here from Corey Bender before we let him go here on Gators Breakdown. Uh, one of the one of the recruits that it's tough to get a beat on, of course, is Derek, uh, defensive lineman Derek Hunter, currently committed to FSU, but not too many out there take that commitment serious. Recently, recently visited Florida. Are the Gators still in heavy pursuit for his services? Yeah, and I think right now with Florida, one of their biggest needs for this class is a strong side defensive end, one of those big bodies on the defensive line who could also shift inside as well, one of those versatile type. And um, this is a kid I think of all the kids they're going after. This is probably the kid they probably have the most familiarity with. I thought earlier in the year before he committed that to see Florida was definitely turning up. And a large part of it had to do with his relationship with Coach and Sari. I mean, that, them two were both very close. And, um, you know, it came, they kind of, they, I'm not going to say they backed away for a little bit, but they kind of cooled off. They're going for some other guys. Obviously, as far as that position, there's a good handful of guys on that list who they're recruiting. And a lot of these kids will be coming in on campus in the next couple of weeks for officials. So, um, obviously they brought him in for an official visit last week and he was the only one on campus. Um, and I think they do have a good chance with him. And, you know, he's a wild card. He's tough to read. And usually in the past, he'd be all open to doing interviews, but he hasn't done one interview since his official. He's kind of been, I don't know. He's like I say, he kind of went into hiding about it. Doesn't really want to talk recruiting, but you know he'll be going to Alabama and Clemson here in the next couple of weeks and back to back weeks for official visits. He already visited Texas A&M, um, and yeah, as you, like you said with Florida State, um, yeah, he released a top five or a top six not too long ago. He didn't have Florida State on it, which makes everything even more strange. Um, but yeah, as far as with him, I think 
he's one of those ones. There is a lot of mutual interest. I just think his mind's somewhat torn as far as what he wants to do. I know he really enjoyed the Texas A and M visit as well. You know, obviously he is familiar with Jimbo from you know when he recruited him before. So um, I think overall, yeah, Florida definitely is going after him. There's guys higher on their board. Definitely, if this Trayvon Walker's committed to Georgia, Nathan Pickering's are on handy. There's other guys that are higher on their board, but I'd be surprised that if you know if he wanted to come forward, Derek Hunter, say, "Hey, I'm going to commit to this class," and say, "Hey, I'm shutting down recruitment," I would have a hard time thinking they would turn down that commitment. But there are guys a little bit higher on their board, but um, it's going to be a wait and see of Hunter. He's the one wild card. He just never really know you know which way he's going to go with his recruitment. So, um, but definitely, there's a lot of familiarity there. And uh, a lot of things going on for the side. But, yeah, we'll see how these next official visits at Clemson and uh, Alabama you know, hold up here in the next couple of weeks. All right, Corey, who are, who are some of the targets out there committed to other schools that could be on flip watch? You know, there, there's some targets out there that the school they're committed to, they ain't hard, they're, they're, they're not having great results on the field this season. So who, who are some of the flip candidates that the Gators are in for right now? Yeah, there's a few guys. Obviously, there's a handful of guys Florida are actually pushing for that are obviously committed to other schools. But, there's three guys that are right now. One of them is a 2020 class. The first time I started with Michael Tarquin, um, offensive tackle, he's in Miami. He's a senior. Um, he's been on campus in back-to-back weeks. You know, he visited for the last two years, Missouri and in South Carolina. Um, and I actually heard from some other people that he actually visited for a couple of months before that. So this is one. He's committed to Miami. He's been committed there since earlier this year. And uh, honestly, he even told me, you know, really this week that his mind basically isn't made up. He doesn't know where he's going to go, and he's going to be early enrolling. So he just says, you know, hope, you know, we'll figure out where I'm going to early enroll here in January. But it's going to come down to Miami and Florida, and I think right now I think it's definitely trending good for Florida. He's been on campus a number of times, and obviously, like you said, with the way Miami season is going and everything like that, that that only helps Florida's chances. Um, he's been out with a torn labor um, for most of this year. So he's a play much this year, but he's a big body, almost 6'6". I'm um, also working, hit the weight room a little bit. Uh, but as far as he's a rugged type, um, hard nosed kid, kind of the type John Hevesy likes as far as along his offensive line. And there's a whole lot of mutual interest there. So Michael Tarquin's one, and another one is Brandon Dorless. Um, he's committed to Virginia Tech. He's out of Deerfield Beach, another defensive lineman. Um, they're recruiting for the, the kind of the same thing, defensive end. Uh, but I think eventually he slides in size and tier guy. I think 6'3", 265, 6'4", 265 in that range. Um, he's committed to VTech, but this is obviously a big offer for him. They sent him an official offer about a month ago. Um, there in Boston, multiple staff members are speaking with him. And uh, he visited this past weekend and basically kind of gave everyone the impression that, uh, you know, he has a decision to make him coming soon. He had a blast of being in Gainesville. And uh, he's definitely one of those prospects who's on flip watch. Uh, as far as the Gators, you know, the in-state kid. So being a South Florida kid, having the opportunity to play for FSU, Miami, or Florida is a dream for a lot of these kids. So um, he has an offer. That's another kid. And the last one, the real chance is uh, Isaiah Walker, the one who's busy this weekend. Uh, Force off to tackle out of Miami. Um, he's committed to uh, South Carolina. A uh, whole lot of mutual interest there. That's one kid. I It wouldn't surprise me at all. I'm not going to say this weekend, but if he eventually made the move, you want to flip the Florida at some point. Yeah, with uh, with with Hevesy there, you know, he's probably going to, want to bring in a lot of a lot of his own offensive linemen there. So yeah, yeah he's a lead type, and there's other guys too. Jerron Handy committed to Auburn, like I said, Nathan Pickering, who's visiting this week in Mississippi State. Um, yeah, like I said, there's 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 a good handful of defensive linemen that are committed. I was where Trevon Walker just fishy visit from who's committed to Georgia. Um, Keandre Jones committed to Auburn. So there's a lot of kids Florida's in play for in the trenches on offense and defense. But the three I mentioned, I think, as far as ones that really keep an eye on right now, I think those would be the three. It's probably, probably the most realistic at this point. Sounds good. Sounds good. So, Corey, before we let you go here, there is a big debate out there just how much success on the field can help recruiting. Things sound good on the surface for some targets, but you know, has, has there been an uptick for the 2019 class with early signing day next month? And the, you know, even going to the 2020 class, if you want to, you know, the success the Gators have had on the field this year is that bleeding over into recruiting. Yeah, I think this. I know a lot of people think it's been, it's been kind of slow at times, but then the day the kids, the, a lot of the prospects in the running for are kids who are just going to take this to the very end. You know, like uh, Elam. You know, you got Chris Steele. It's not that you know Florida's not winning enough and they're not getting the guys in early. It's just a lot of these kids, Boyd Summerall. You know, Keon Zipper, I think with Boyd Summer and Keon Zipper from Lakeland, I think they'll eventually be Gators, but it's one of those things where Florida's class is 26 right now, but I can see that number drastically changing here in the next month and a half because you have so many kids who are going to announce 
either in January, obviously they had Chris Steele who possibly could pick Florida, Keon Zipper and them who are early who are hoping to sign early. So um I think a lot of people I think a lot of people just have to understand these kids these are big decisions for these kids. So it's not that Florida is, isn't having the momentum like some of these other schools like at Georgia who just, you know, picked up a kid this weekend from South Florida. I just think a lot of these kids, no matter what position Florida is in or what schools they're gonna pick, I think overall they're just gonna wait it out. So I think Florida could you know, once it comes early sign period in January, they can have a major splash to get several commitments, and that number's going to change. So um, that could go up. But I think as far as the 2020 targets, I think that could be a big year for Florida, too. There's a lot of kids that have Florida on that short list, like five-star cornerback Fred Davis, five-star wide receiver Leonard Manuel. I mean, the list goes on and on. Michael Weidman, Zykevius Walker, all these kids are four-star prospects that have Florida on the short list. So I think 2020 class, that's the one class I kind of publicly said that, it can end up being pretty special for Florida if they just kind of continue what they're doing and the way they're recruiting these kids. And um, like I said, I think both classes can end up very well, you know, towards the very end of it. In 2019, you have about five kids who I kind of predict eventually could be Florida Gators. So I think that number could drastically change. It's just worth the crunch time. A lot of kids are taking business, and they're not going to, you know, they're not going to just make a sudden announcement. They want to really you know, do their homework on these schools. And But I think all of that could really bowl well for Florida with a good handful of them. Sounds good, Corey. And well, what you guys got coming up uh, for uh, you know Gators territory and the Rivals Network? Yeah, a ton of stuff, man. I mean, I took over in April. We have a lot of great stuff coming to the website. We have a podcast that will be launching here pretty soon. Uh, but, you know, obviously Jackie Franchuli, she covers the team stuff for us. Michael Flores, we have we basically kind of cover everything, man. So um, recruiting is always always going. You know, every single day of the week, we're doing covering each sport. So um, if you haven't tried this out, Florida.Rivals.com, please give us a shot at. Um, I think you guys want to be disappointed. We have a lot of great stuff coming out. Absolutely. Corey, I've heard, I've heard so much uh, you know, about you, and people wanted you on here on Gators Breakdown to talk recruiting. So definitely got you to, to talk uh, the, you know, the, the hectic world of recruiting as it is. And, uh, hey, it's only, go, it's only going to get crazier for the next two months. Yeah, I know, right? Like I said, fantastic to see you, man. And, uh, yeah, thanks so much for having me on, David. Much appreciated. All right, that's Corey Bender from Gators Territory on the Rivals Network. Sure, watching football is fun, but it's more entertaining when you have some action on the games. Guys, you've heard me talking about this before, and some of you are still waiting on the sidelines. Whether you're an expert or a rookie, you should be betting with my bookie. There's so much to bet on, college football and basketball, NBA, NHL, custom props, even esports, you name it. My bookie has been in the business for years, they've got great online reviews, and their mobile site is easy to use. Sign up this week and MyBookie will give you a 50% deposit bonus to jumpstart your bankroll. It's a great way to bank even more money when you win. Also, make sure to follow MyBookie at BetMyBookie on Twitter or Instagram. They personally respond to every mention and DM, not to mention they've given away nearly $10,000 in free money to their followers this football season. You'll be the first to know as soon as new odds and props are posted. So log on to MyBookie, use promo code GATORS, to get your 50% deposit bonus. That's promo code GATORS at MyBookie. You play, you win, you get paid with my bookie. All right, so let's take a quick look at the Gators' opponent for Saturday. The Idaho Vandals, hey, four and six on the season. Started out this year getting torched by Fresno State, 79 to 13. Gave up 754 total yards to Idaho State earlier this year. On the year, they're averaging scoring 26 points a game while giving up 35 in FCS competition, giving up nearly 214 yards per game on the ground while averaging only 383 yards of total offense per game. So this is a uh, pretty bad FCS team coming into the swamp uh, that, that, that the Gators will handle pretty easily. Uh, this is a game where starters could be, or you know, starters should be able to, to sit by halftime, if not sooner. Uh, a game where we can expect to see many new faces on the field and uh, hopefully come away injury-free with the big showdown versus uh, FSU next week. So, you know, there's a little bit of summary there uh, for the for, for the Vandals of Idaho. You know, I asked you guys out there your thoughts uh, on this game, you know, with it being an overmatched opponent. What do you want to see when Florida plays Idaho on Saturday? And, uh, you know, you know let's share some of those. Uh, some good thoughts uh, come from you uh, out there. Our contributor, and on every so often, you know, Bill Sykes, um, just win. It's already FSU week to me. You know, I'm kind of in, in that mindset as well. So uh, just ready to get past this game. But, you know, there, there are some things that we will see in this game. 
Uh, and I know a lot of you want to see as well as far as you know, on field performance versus Idaho. Swim Gator, uh, South Life Gold, says at this point, whatever makes it fun. Haven't had a lot of that lately. I like to see the players having a good time along with the fans. No drama, just football. You know, yes, some drama last week, of course, with the whole uh, Kyle Trash, Felipe Franks, uh, Felipe Franks shushing the crowd, all that, all that kind of talk. Uh, yeah, I think we can kind of move a, move past that a little bit right now. And you know, this is the game where the players should have some fun. Uh, they, they've had a tough schedule up to this point. Uh, great comeback victory versus South Carolina last week after you know, bouncing back from that Missouri loss and the Georgia loss. You know, so uh, this, this team probably hasn't had a whole lot of fun since the bye week. Uh, and good to come out uh, on top in that comeback victory versus South Carolina. I mean, the second half of that game was a lot of fun. So this is a game where the players can have a lot of fun. And, uh, yeah, and, and probably a pretty drama-free game when it's all said and done. Ryan Cushman uh, says, offensively, no turnovers. Dominant rushing attack uh, spread amongst the three backs. Get Copeland touches, no three and outs. Uh, and defensively, no passing touchdowns allowed. Drastic improvement on third down and leave the game with no injuries. So, yeah, going back to uh, you know, the offense part of this, no turnovers. Yeah, absolutely. You, know, you want to see a, a clean game here against the team you should be able to, to, to have a clean game uh, against. Dominant rushing attack, I, I think we'll definitely see that. As I say, you know, in FCS, Idaho giving up 214 yards a game on the ground. Uh, that's what we've seen from this Florida rushing attack. Um, you know, you keep the ball out of your quarterback's hands too. Uh, as well, you know, kind of save your quarterback from getting injured. I wouldn't expect a whole lot of quarterback runs this game, uh, whatever, who, whoever's that quarterback and how that plays out. And then, uh, so, yeah, uh, spread amongst the three backs. Yeah, you, uh, Scarlett, P. Ryan, probably some carries early. But then I think we'll see kind of Pierce come in and probably uh, Clement should be, you know, we'll, he'll get redshirted, but this is a game he can come in and one of the fresh faces that we'll talk about uh, as well. I think Clement can come in and maybe garner some carries to, you know, to keep his redshirt as well uh, there. Uh, also, you know, he says Jake will and get some touches. We'll see, you know, uh, this is a game where he should be uh, pop, probably finally inserted uh, to see what he can do uh, with, the, with the ball in his hands in a game type of situation. So I would expect uh, Jake Wacopin to, to, to get some touches as well. Defensively, no passing touchdowns allowed. Would be nice to see after what we've seen the last few weeks uh, from this passing defense. Can they cover a tight end this game <laughs> against an overmatched opponent? You know, we'll see that. And drastic improvement on third down. Yeah, kind of continue that from the South Carolina game. South Carolina one of six in, the, uh, in third down conversions uh, last week. So for this Gator defense to be able to continue not third down defense, uh, that, that would be uh, – you know, a trend that can keep going in the right direction there. Ron Noel at, uh, at Noel Ron says, Come out firing on all cylinders. It's not wise to play Emory considering he's the number two quarterback. He can only play in two more games, but I'd like to see him. A cope appearance, while unlikely, would be fun. Pierce over 100 yards rushing, zero third and long conversions by our defense and a few takeaways. So, yeah, come out firing on all cylinders. Definitely, that's one of the things I'll be looking for. I mean, you guys know if you've listened to the last couple of weeks to, 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 to Gators' breakdown of about how chronicled the slow starts from the offense and now recently the defense as well. Yeah, come out firing in all cylinders. This is a, a team you should be able to do that against. Can we take away a whole lot from it? Not necessarily, but it does you know, lend itself to the mental preparation of being there and ready for this game and ready to come out firing so you can get your starters off the field and get some other guys some playing time. Uh, it's not wise to play Emory. We'll see how this shakes out. I have no idea what they'll want to do with Emory Jones and whether they see some, you know, some, uh, some good to come out of playing some, a lot of snaps in this game or to save him just in case Franks gets hurt. Uh, with the FSU and the bowl game coming up, you know, can Kyle Trask come back and play in the bowl game? That's the word right now. If he can, maybe, maybe you play Emory in Idaho and FSU game and letting him practice for the bowl games but not necessarily play him there. Well, you know, we'll see. I have no idea how this works out, what the coaches want to do, if Emory wants the red shirt. Uh, I'm pretty sure they want to save the red shirt. So how do they play him in, in two of the next three games? Do they see more? They can take away from him taking a, a lot of snaps versus Idaho or in a special role against Florida State or taking a lot of snaps in the bowl game. There, you know, there's those scenarios there of how um, we'll, we might see Emory Jones over the next few weeks. 
And let's see here. Uh, Trey Moves 66 says, Freshman, let's see the future with Mullins guys. Send Bernie on the blitz. Let young guys get to the quarterback, make plays, and touch the ball. Not one starter gets hurt, so we are at full strength. And, um, yeah, that would be uh, send Bernie on the blitz. You know, Amari Bernie could get some playing time. they have been backing up Chauncey Gardner in practice a good bit this uh, this year. Uh, we've seen him play, you know, special teams. We saw him play early in the season as well. So I think Amari Bernie is one of those, guys, you know, fresh faces, young faces that we'll see probably a lot of uh, this game, kind of use his size and speed all over the field and see what he can do. Um, let young guys get to the quarterback. You know, we'll see. Oh, you know, Chatfield and, and, and Langham, those guys, they can get, they go get some playing time as well. You know, with this this new four-game redshirt rule, you know, these guys, this might have been the game anyway. You know, they, they could have played in one game anyway. Uh, a lot of these guys, you know, played in Charleston Southern. Uh, if they didn't play in that game, this would be the game they play a whole lot in. So we will see a whole lot of new faces, I think, uh, there when it's all said and done. So, you know, maybe we'll see, uh, uh, you know, Higgins or uh, Huggins, um, and those guys going out there and, and, and getting some, some playing time in, in the backfield as well, defensive backfield. So we'll see how it all goes uh, when it's all said and done with these, uh, these uh, young guys going out there and, and getting some playing time. So yeah, uh, Steed, Design, Steed Designs, Sean Steed says, you know, lots of young faces and uh, he, he, com he commented, uh, c commented on them as well and, and naming them there. Chatfield, Baby Reese, Ventrell Miller, James Houston, Huggins, Copeland, Grimes, Pierce, Clement, Kroll. Yes, I mean, some of the guys we've seen in, in, in Ventrell Miller and James Houston, but another game where those guys, you know, we'll see them next year on the field to so get those guys some playing time. Uh, baby Reese, yeah, baby David Reese there, and the other David Reese, uh, the freshman there, maybe he gets some playing time uh, in this game as well. Yeah, so yeah, just a lot of young faces. I think a lot of fans out there want want to see. You know, some some guys that we expect to make some contributions uh, in the years coming up. Uh, so Michael Pounders, Michael Lee, put the game out of reach quick. Uh, get some quality playing time for these freshmen. Uh, Lee Barnhart, um, <laughs> this is pretty funny. A good band performance in Albert and Alberta. You know, these are the these are the type of games that you should be able to you know have some fun with, uh, have a joke or two with. Yeah, so you know, Lee wants to see the uh, good band performance in the the Albert and Alberta uh, there when it's all said and done. At, at Sean Steers, all potential redshirt candidates get significant play in time. Let Tony play quarterback a bit. Give Pierce significantly more carries. And yeah, the, the, you say give Tony the, the play quarterback a bit. You know, that may be the case if they don't want to play Emory Jones in this game. You know, and Nick Sproles, also another quarterback uh, there that's on the roster that probably will play a good bit if you want to say, if you don't want to play Emory Jones in this game. Franks is not going to play the whole game, nor should he. Uh, the injury to Kyle Trask does kind of throw a wrench into that, but I don't think you want Franks out there the whole entire game uh, either. Uh, let's see. Uh, skip the R at um, Bamba Blam 8. Uh, start off the game strong. We always start the game off slowly on offense and defense. Yeah, I kind of mentioned that uh, lately. Um, and a good one here from uh, at King Grizz. Play to our level, not down to theirs. You know, and in years past, a lot of Gator fans and we. That's what we saw when no matter who Florida was playing under the old regime, under Jim McElwain, under Will Muschamp, is playing down to the level of the competition. No matter how that team looked, no matter how bad they were, the Gators would find a way to make a close game that shouldn't be close, a close game in, in the end, having to pull some of those out, having prayers answered against Louisiana Lafayette's of the world. And no, that doesn't need to happen. It uh, shouldn't happen this game. This team, Idaho, is not a very good FCS team. This, is a team, uh, this, this should look a lot like the Charleston Southern game. When it's all said and done, this is the type of performance we should expect in a game like this. So yeah, play, play to our level, not down to theirs. It's definitely something we want to see, should see, and need to see out of this Gator team. Stephen Howell, 100% focus and domination. I don't think we can afford to look past any team right now. I want to see Coach preach to the guys how every game requires 110% from everyone. I know we could easily win this, but I hope the guys use this as a chance to build and gain more confidence. Yeah, no, I think you know you could probably take a little bit uh, of that from it. Uh, this team is Idaho's bad, so Florida could play bad and still win by 30, probably. <laughs> but uh, yeah, you would like to see the focus there, kind of a coming off the bounce back uh, performance uh, with the, the the comeback versus South Carolina, continue to build on that with the big rivalry game coming up next week. Uh, some funny one here, Kenny Barassa. I uh, hope I said that right, Kenny. Uh, he has one, two, three, and four. 
first quarter points, second quarter points, third quarter points, fourth quarter points. Yeah, so <laughs> there we go. Uh, absolutely, we want to see that. Uh, at Run Pod says, I don't want to see Tony on the field ever. Don't need an injury to him. Give him an extra bye week. Same with C.J. Henderson. So, yeah, definitely uh, some importance there of keeping players healthy. I th you might see Tony one or two drives, three drives maybe at the, uh, at there, get him off the field. But I definitely do agree with the C.J. Henderson win. Don't let him play a lot. He doesn't, he doesn't need to play a lot in this game. Uh, don't need another corner, starting corner to go back. We saw what Georgia was able to do when he was out of the game a few weeks ago. So you want him healthy for this FSU game coming up uh, as well. So C.J. Henderson definitely one player that cannot come out of this game with an injury. At the uh, angered shrimp, uh, last few thoughts here. He says, fewer penalties on the offensive line, less communication issues on the back end, and more opportunities for the wide receivers down the field. Absolutely there. You know, after last week, I pointed out, you know, Juwan Taylor on Twitter. I pointed out the, the good that he did, but a lot of you uh, didn't let me forget about the uh, penalties <laughs> that uh, uh, Taylor had as well. So absolutely, some more focus on the offensive line. You know, no, no, no dumb penalties there uh, to, to stall drives. Uh, it, definitely the less communication issues on the back end and in the linebacker position. And of course, that's where some of those tight ends have been getting open, where the Reese and Vashawn Joseph, for whatever reason, the communication hasn't been there uh, the last couple of weeks, and tight ends have been able to, to find their way open. So I know Todd Grantham has talked about that this week, uh, and maybe those guys, you know, trying to figure something out where the communication is not an issue uh, you know, on the back end and uh, at the linebacker position. And definitely gets to push the ball down the field. It's been, you know, the, the, the passing game last week, of course, was, uh, was, was in the game plan to, to kind of protect Franks. And, you know, you, this game is one you should be able to hit some downfield shots. Uh, and, and kind of blow some plays open. Tim Olson uh, at Gator Pro says, a different thought here, he goes, he'd play Emory Jones the whole game, then save him for the bowl game. If needed at FSU, uh, then he plays that instead of bowl game since Trask will be back. So yeah, you know, if it, I think if the coaches know for sure that Kyle Trask can play in the bowl game, then you kind of can play it by ear. Um, playing Emory Jones the whole game here, and to save him for the bowl game, but yeah, he's right. You know, if needed at FSU, then he plays in that game instead of the bowl game. But you definitely want him to, you know, to, to be able to uh, take all those practices in the bowl game. So you'll be getting those either way. Uh, but yeah, you, you can kind of play it by ear with what you want to do with Emory Jones. All right, last few thoughts here. Uh, I think they got to give Emory at least 80% of the snaps. This is from uh, uh, Albert SSGT. Um, yeah, give Emory 80% of the snaps. He's our backup. And has, and has almost zero experience. Fans want him playing against FSU, but I think Franks give us our best option to win on the road. Not a true freshman that has played 10 snaps. Uh, some more thoughts here with uh, Emory Jones and how to do it. Uh, Mr. Michael Smith says, try Tony at quarterback or anyone else who can manage the position. With so much emphasis on Emory Jones' red shirt, I wouldn't mind seeing a capable backup take some snaps. So, yeah, you know, a lot of um, ways and thoughts of how to handle Emory Jones here. And, um, you know, only the coaches know how they want to, to, to handle that. And everybody's kind of got their opinion on how they want to see it play out or how it should play out. But in the end, uh, you know, the, the coaches will make that decision. And, uh, you know, we'll see. We'll see how it turns out. Uh, it is, I don't think it matters either way if we see him this week. Or, you know, I don't think necessarily he'll play the FSU game. I don't necessarily think you'll have a package in that game. So I think it's this game and the bowl game, but you kind of do have to keep in the back of your mind if Felipe France gets hurt, gets hurt, you know, what do you do? So I think that's how they'll play it, and I think that's how they want to play it. But we'll see how it all works out in the end. All right, so take a, let's take a look at, before we get done here, let's take a look around the SEC for Week 12 uh, and, of course, uh, what else is going on around uh, teams of interest here. So cup Cupcake City here in the SEC this week. Uh, so four noon game kickoffs here. We have the Citadel in Alabama, Idaho in Florida, Middle Tennessee in Kentucky, and Arkansas at Mississippi State. So that's uh, an SEC versus SEC matchup. That game is on ESPN uh, as well. So you get a... You know, okay SEC matchup there with Arkansas and Mississippi State, but before that, like I said, Cupcake City, the Citadel in Alabama, Idaho in Florida, Middle Tennessee and Kentucky, and then the CBS 330 game of the week, Missouri and Tennessee. Can Tennessee continue 
their positive outlook on the rest of this season in Missouri after back-to-back -back wins over Vanderbilt and Florida. Uh, can they, you know, they, they were winless before the Florida game in conference. Can they get their third uh, SEC win in a row here? And at 4 o'clock, you have two games, UMass and Georgia, Liberty and Auburn. And then the night games at 7 o'clock, UAB, Texas A&M. Uh, that game is uh, in ESPN2. UAB, not too bad of a program there. So, you know, Florida played them last year in this same uh, week. So UAB, I think, 9-1 and one on the season. Uh, they're playing at Texas A&M. And then to round out uh, the night here, all three 730 games here, Rice and LSU, Ole Miss and Vanderbilt. Chattanooga and South Carolina, the Gators' opponent from last week. So Ole Miss and Vanderbilt could be a uh, pretty good game uh, when it's all said and done. And then Florida State hosts Boston College, and Miami travels to Virginia Tech. Both of those games were at 3:30. So you know the slate this week uh, not the best for college football. So definitely we can keep an eye on the FSU and Boston College a week before we play the Seminoles and see how it all uh, pans out. Uh, see if uh, Boston College is starting quarterback not playing that game, but. They got that strong running game going, so we'll see how Florida State handles that. And then Miami loses the four straight at Virginia Tech. Virginia Tech not playing too well either. Uh, so we'll see how that game uh, all shakes out. But definitely keep an eye on uh, Florida State and Boston College at 3.30 since the Gators play the Seminoles next week. So everybody, thanks for listening to this episode of Gators Breakdown. It was uh, We had Corey Bender on and talking some recruiting, uh, good info there and what the Gators have. You know, coming up with early signing day, just a little over a month away, and a look at this Idaho Vandal game preview. I'm your host of Gators Breakdown, David Waters. You can find me on Twitter at GatorDave underscore SCC. Guys and girls out there, thanks for listening to this episode of Gators Breakdown. <laughs>